If you haven't met him, this is Luke Brooker, everyone. Say hello. Hello. He did an awesome presentation at Camp JS, and he's going to give us the rundown on exactly that again. And uh, he's talking about minimizing CSS complexity. Oh, uh, I get new bad batteries. Bad batteries? <laughs> You're going to have to yell. Wait. Yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. You're good. Oh, it doesn't have a light on. No, it's good. All right, there we go. It's and it needs light on when it fucking. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, but a couple of that. It turns off the light to save the batteries. I put this on the first one. Yeah. Make sure you put this on the video. Okay. Cool. Everyone can hear me. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, yeah, minimizing CSS complexity. Uh, anyone here feel like they're CSS, they don't have complex problems with CSS? <laughs> Good thing, <sir>. Cool. <clears throat> so yeah, to just to sort of um, visualize my thinking about CSS, I found this really original GIF that I don't think anyone's ever seen before. <laughs> Okay, complexity. What's the definition of complexity here in this situation? There is no absolute de definition of what complexity means. The only consensus among researchers is that there is no agreement about the specific definition of complexity. CSS right there, people. Thank, thanks, Wikipedia. Um, so yes, what... I have to mirror my screen, so I don't know what's next. We kind of, yeah, we, Everyone, no one totally feels like they've solved CSS yet. But um, just to sort of get to where we're at currently at, I sort of look at where we, how we got here. Um, and as far as CSS goes, it's sort of, when did it start out? What was its goals? Originally, it was very document focused. So it was like semantic HTML and used CSS to style it when it first got it. So something like thinking about a document and yeah headings and you know normal stuff paragraphs and then applications came along and we struggled for a while and then everyone's like sort of started to get around some like organization strategies like them and you know all of a sort of smacks and them and suit and all that and then you're like yeah let's write reusable css components um, like sweet, yeah, I got this, like just put all that whole component stuff in CSS. It's like, yep, works, works pretty well. I have a button component and what sort of mod, uh, modifiers of that. And then we have reality. Um, <laughs> we actually start <laughs> developing. And then you put it in a different context. <laughs> Things change. <clears throat> so why do the, why do we have problems like this still? Because we have these verbose components. We used to try to put a lot of stuff into a single component. Lots of all these contexts, all these modifiers for different contexts. Um, and it's not just CSS. We have JavaScript still, and we have the actual what it takes to create the component. We need all of that sort of encapsulated. So trying to do lots of it in CSS, we're sort of trying to use CSS for things it wasn't really designed for. And also we have deadlines. So when you're trying to get things done, that's when you do come up with these crazy modifiers and you're putting them in different places if you're putting too much into a component. So all of these sort of problems <clears throat> A part of the reason, like I, I did the whole BEM thing and the suit thing and, and all those sorts of things, and then that sort of led me to Atomic CSS. Has anyone here heard of Atomic CSS? Yeah, at Camp JS. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So, many of you, any, well, any of the people that do know Atomic CSS, 
people don't tend to like it very much. Um, and this is specifically what I'm talking about, is like, I was actually using the variant where you don't actually write any CSS, you write class names that have a specific syntax and it generates a CSS file for you, which I think was awesome. Um, and then those, each of these things in here was basically just a variable in a JSON file that I was looking at. But you could, yeah, and you got a bunch of classes there. Um, some people didn't like that. So I'm gonna focus more on what I actually learned when I was using Atomic CSS, because that's applicable to everything in CSS. And there is slightly better way. There are some problems with Atomic CSS too. So the first thing I sort of found that I needed to do when I was writing Atomic CSS was start with a clean slate. And what I mean by that is because you're writing lots of small classes, like every single style you write, it's like a single class. So we've sort of, a lot of people use normalize, it's sort of, it still leaves a bunch of stuff styled to like a, what we probably don't want in our application. We had reset, which did a, like a even weirder kind of, it sort of didn't actually reset and then it changed things again. And what I sort of tend to prefer is actually more of a reset plus like an inheritance type thing where you actually just say inherit anything that would be its own, have its own style. You basically say, no, just get this from the root of the document. So everything, you start with a total clean slate, everything doesn't have any style at all to begin with. I mean, if you have a blog, this might not be the most ideal approach, but for applications, as far as that's concerned, it makes it really nice to use because so if you set this on all of those things, so the body with like a font family, font size and color, that's how it comes in a normalize. So you've still got the colors and the, you get the font family, but um, you still got all the styles coming through on the buttons. And like the reset is weird because it actually still has like the, the actual font sizes are different on the inputs and buttons and things, but then when we actually get to the inherent one, like everything just looks like text. So it's really easy to just, you're never actually overriding anything. You're always doing additive stuff. Hey Luke, sorry, I'm just slow on the, um, the normalize, inherit, and reset. What, what, what are they? So, so this is just sort of um, ways to sort of reset your CSS. Um, in terms of reset was like Eric Meyer's sort of like CSS reset, and then normalize the CSS was something Nicholas Gallagher sort of started where it was like sort of basically trying to normalize between all the browsers like here's what like your defaults are so it's basically your defaults before you start writing your application specific styles um interestingly like normalize even nicholas gallagher has actually passed that on i think now to other maintainers because he's sort of changed his approach as well um and i mean as far as semantics are concerned the uh um, <clears throat> a lot of people sort of like the idea of like, yeah, you style your buttons like a button would be generally, and you, you sort of, they think, you know, semantically it would, should look like this, but it actually makes it harder to use things properly. If you say you want just a, like a cancel somewhere, and like semantically that should be a button, but some people are more inclined to make it a link because actually I want it to look like a link, but semantically it should be a button, but they'll use a link anyway. Whereas if you have it like this, you have a very simple class that it doesn't have to do any overrides it's basically just make it look like a link so then you end up with a button and it just has very minimal css it's actually only two lines of css for those things <clears throat> go next cool the other thing that with atomic css is it sort of codifies your design constraints so examples or well, traits I tend to call them as well so because everything in with the atomic CSS is a lot atomizer type thing it takes in you can give it like raw values or you, or you can basically point it at variable type things and for your margin and your padding you base you can base everything off say a vertical rhythm or some sort of consistent spacing uh, your colors are all in variables. I guess everyone's used to this from uh, SAS and having variables, but the difference between having these here is you have a single class. If you want to set the color to a primary color, 
that's a single class to set the color to primary everywhere or a background color to primary everywhere. It's not putting it and replicating all this CSS everywhere, just using variables. And same with like the type, you can set the scale and you only ever use these six different font sizes and then you always reuse those classes everywhere. Um, if you have different levels of shadows, if you've seen something like Google's design system, it's not the material design system, it's only got, it's got like a scale of shadows. So then Z indexes you can keep together um, and name them. And then you can have like, like stuff that has more than one line of CSS, but is like only ever does one job. Uh, those can be in the single classes as well. Another thing I found is avoiding the cascade. So basically imagining that you don't have any control about where anything ends up in a style sheet. So you don't worry about the its order. And I found this little interesting thing on the W3C's documentation about the cascade and inheritance. Fortunately, they aren't very difficult to grasp. So maybe we should show them this. Um, so when I talk about overrides, saying if you if you have say the default button and a button primary, rather than actually overriding it, just remove the actual say the color gray in that case, remove that from the button and have like a button default or something like that. Never have like try and do always do additive type stuff. Um, this isn't a problem so much in Atomic CSS itself because it has ways to do this, but if you're just doing lots of like tiny classes, if you then want to do it in a responsive state, it, it kind of can be a bit painful if you're trying to then do at this different size, do this color and this thing because you have to then write extra classes for every media query. But there's potential ways around that later. Um, and like hovers and things like that as well has the same problem. Just means a little bit more CSS, but not any, definitely not as much as normal. So the big difference is sort of tiny little design patterns versus say one big button component, which is very like imperative. So someone here's like everything that it does. It's like more like you might have seen this before. So, whoop, past. So you, you sort of traits compose together. You have all these things that you have like a sort of single library of traits, and then you compose them together to create a component itself. And so it's sort of like your design constraints coming together to create this one unified thing. Um, you also don't abstract too early. If you have all these sort of classes, all these things, you, like from you using your design constraints, you can kind of design in code a lot easier because you're not saying, oh, it has to be a button and then I'm like, oh, it has this, this modifier, oh, that one doesn't quite work in this situation. You can just be like adding for like, I want some padding, I want some margin, I want it to do this, I want it to do that. Then be like, okay, this is actually looking like something we already have or no, this is something new. We'll put all these into a component and then start to make that reusable. So it's a really quick iteration cycle for doing design in code. Um, so you still might not, be totally agreeing with me yet. That's a lot of classes. Some people might think. So that's another reason it makes you write, you stop writing CSS. So like that's that was the big one of the biggest takeaways for me in some CSS. Like you really want to try and write as little as possible because every time you write CSS you're adding a class. So Funnily enough, minimizing CSS minimizes CSS complexity. So how do we write not as much CSS? Um, so currently how people like to think about CSS, or they don't like to think about it, but they tend to just think about it by default, is this is how you like, you write CSS. <laughs> do it, do it, do it, do it, damn it. And then somebody comes into the project and they see something like this, and you end up with a project like this, then you might get some reactions like this. <clears throat> so, how, what's an example of how we can sort of fix these things? So, I have a few, I will switch over now. So this is, you might have seen it before, this is Bootstrap. And I'm actually based this off the 
beta version of four, so it's trying to give them as much um, an advantage as possible. This is their latest sort of CSS. Um, and how many lines I pull, tried to pull out just the stuff that was needed for this navigation bar. <laughs> <clears throat> that was a four minute. So there we go. So we got 518 lines of CSS. Um, you can see here, like lots of there's your button class, a bunch of stuff, and here's some lots of sort of worrying about focus and stuff specific to the button, setting like slight variations of colors on hovers and focuses. So I thought, how can we do this? <clears throat> A little bit differently. I didn't do an exact replica because I tried to do it actually with um, consistent spacing and font sizes around and basing on scales. Um, so there is a few extra classes here. They're not like direct classes, but I wouldn't. This isn't actually production code either, by the way. A lot of this I'm, I'm doing a lot of React stuff, so a lot of this is being deferred into components, and so you don't have to write these classes every single time. Um, and Depending on how you do it, you might not even have to worry about what the classes are named either. So I've got my sort of basic reset of the button there on the end inputs. <clears throat> so you can see like this is just sort of some very minimal like reset with inherit. And then I have the basic reset for a. a. So setting sort of my basic body stuff, contain, which is for this main container, like all the display classes, something very similar. Um, so the hovers, there, don't know. Anyway, probably have an even better example. But yeah, so the colors, light, dark, Success, sort of like looking at variables, but they basically just reuse them. Um, basically, trying to abstract everything out into a single class. And so, some of the things as well, like in the Bootstrap one, they this was every time there was like a hover, they were actually changing the color with like RGBA. Whereas, if you could actually just change it with opacity, and then you can. Like if I wanted this whole thing here was just if I want to change the top one, um, I could do it really simply just with two classes. And they're not doing a whole heap of stuff. All they do is set the background of that div to dark and the um, color of the text to light. And then it's just everything else sort of cascades down. There's like can potentially use current color in certain situations. So you've got, here's my spacing classes, or like based off a scale, or just doing minimal stuff. Like, so the links just got hovers. So this is like 172 lines CSS and using Flexbox for the actual layout of this here, which makes it a lot easier. So centering it all. And the links itself, just the changing the opacity. So I'll get sort of a slightly more complex example. So this is one from my work from like a recent sort of a UI library that they have there. Um, and this is all the styles that we needed for this button. Um, I mean, for a single button. Yep, but this is like, this is all the um, modifiers and things that they had for, because it actually has different, like your primaries and your called action type ones and inverted and, and all that sort of stuff. So, and this is the output of SAS, obviously, like, I mean, I don't like using SAS, but that's what they were using. And things like margins, probably shouldn't deal with margins inside the component itself, that should be dealt with the parent. But here's like sort of a version that there was still a bit of CSS here, but all of this can be reused across the whole application. It's not just for the button. So typical resets again. 
um, and sort of on light to dark background colors, light, dark, primary for the colors, spacing classes again, the display classes. So we've got some tracking to change the letter spacing, rounded to do the border radius, rotating for some more letter. But it, so you just when we want to actually do modifiers of it now, I can do, say I want a primary button on a light background. So now I've got that, and because of the way I was doing, this actually has like a, a full like pseudo um, element that's doing this stuff in the background here. And I can also do a, just remember what this was. Yeah, it was light and hollow. So make the texture light and hollow. So that was just a single class there. So that, that's probably like the biggest actual selector and what it does. But you can see here the background color, three using current color which if anyone hasn't seen that before, that's just taking the current text font color and using that in the background. Um, and then everything else, it's sort of reusing a lot of stuff as much as possible. That's a pseudo selector, but you can then change, if you want to say, I want this to be dark on light, that will still work perfectly fine. That's, as I said, it's still just doing background color and the um, the text color itself, so because it's taking that shadow, so box shadow is doing some of that stuff. Did you write any of the stuff on the right, or is it all built on the left? Um, so no, this is actually just me doing raw HTML CSS. This isn't actually Atomic CSS. Okay. In the in the fact of the, the library Atomic CSS, because that that has a different sort of syntax. So this is I tried to just get it down to like me just writing some basic CSS and in HTML. So. Um, so we can actually, the way I've also done this is like, rather than the parent worrying about what's inside of here, I can um, take say, this thing out of here and put it like a, the original one actually said to do all this other stuff here, but then you can just take with the, bot, the parents that are controlled what it did. Um, but if you, this button is totally reusable in terms of like you can put anything in it so we don't have to have modifiers for an icon button or another button. I can totally just remove this thing from inside of it and the parent doesn't need to worry, it just works as a button still. So all of it's just sort of like lots of smaller CSS. So it's just, what's another, actually I had a little thing here. Uh, size, yes, that's another one. So, what did I have? That's another big one. Size, so everything, all the um, margin and width on the particular button are size with M's. So I can do, then the font scale, I can do, oh, I actually want this to be a bigger button. I just change the font size. Um, and now it's a bigger button. So I want it smaller. I can do M1 because everything's, all the um, actual stuff around, all the actual button measurements are in M's. So rather than having to adjust the padding on every different size, all I'm doing is changing the font size. I'm not changing any other things about it. Um, all the actual spacing is done with that. What did I just do? Um, with these sizes and these colors and all these things, you've got 170 lines for a button. They also get reused for your other components in your HTML. Is that the idea, or we yeah. use 170 yeah. purely for the button? Yeah, no, that's they can be reused anyway because all that is is just font size. Like, I mean, this is purely like cherry picking all the like things I just need for this button. This would actually be not in one big CSS file like this. You would have like <laughs> here's my spacing stuff, here's my font stuff, like my top my type things, here's my colors. Yep. So same similar way you have like variables and stuff but you put them in a single file for each one. Um, and like I was saying here, like this, the only reason it's doing so much too, if I, if I want a really basic button, it wouldn't need 170 lines of these reusable things, but this original button, it actually has 200 and something lines because of the, the way the interaction works and how it does so many things. And like actually trying to figure out what it does here is actually 
would be way more complicated. It's not very really self-explanatory when you can't read it because it's class and sort of it's sort of doing all this before stuff and that's all of this is just doing the same thing as what I'm doing with those simple classes, but it's trying to deal with like colours and and um Crew just looked at your left hand pane because yours is a lot longer, but it actually is much more descriptive to read. You don't need to go into your CSS to see what it's doing, it's all there on the left. Yeah, yeah, and that's how if you have, if anyone's seen there's a guy called Adam Morse, or he is like but his Twitter URL is like Murmurs, or whatever. I think that's his website as well. So M R M R S with an underscore at the front. Um, he has a website and he's done like he had this big article about um, this type of thing. And he basically said that, like, you when you want to look at your HTML, you want to see what your CSS is doing, like, by looking at it, it's like more descriptive. Um, yeah, and that's what I found. Like, I, I, I was using this in a project with Atomic CSS, and then you can use it in other ways now, which I'll explain in a minute. But um, yeah, it's it's definitely way more explicit, and then you're sort of composing all these things together, and you. Like even with the, the, the light on hover type thing, that's it, sort of explaining, it's sort of, the main part of it is just saying it's making the text sort of light on hover, so the color is that, and then it's getting the background color and setting it to whatever the current color is. And that's like the main thing that's doing, and then the fade on hover is just doing a similar type of thing, but just, I think use that there too, and then it's, just doing the, <clears throat> getting the same current color, but just doing like a sort of a light, it's like a faded version of it. Um, go to next. Mm. So I did have, okay, cool. So as far as um, we're bringing this back to your actual application and actually how to implement something like this, and like technically, I mean, I've tried to simplify it down just to some like little like ways of changing how you write CSS there, but implementing it, um, sort of the steps to think of is getting that sort of very like clean slate restart, reset sort of in there. Um, using some sort of trace library, whether that's, so you can have like, yeah, your spa here's my spacing classes and here's my um, color classes and that type of thing in a library, and then sort of composing them together. Now, how you technically do this is sort of a bit different because as you say it still sort of sounds a bit like atomic css you're still having looking like at all that css classes but we have other solutions so css in javascript if you instead of actually having a trace library breed classes it could just be like a javascript module that exports like objects and you can use like functions to do your scale things like that and then you basically and, or even the actual functions themselves can be basically here's my scale function, pass it like a one or a two, and like that's the, my font scale. And that's what I'm actually starting to lean towards a bit more now as well. Um, specifically, I'll mention that at the end anyway. Um, CSS modules is a big one. I've been using that currently to do a lot of this stuff. So you can have like, I actually have like a traits folder with these class names in there, and then you can actually use write CSS. But when you want to reuse things, you write like composers, and then you like reference the file. But it still feels a little bit verbose um, for what I'm trying to do, which is minimize CSS. And you can potentially write this in like a BEM type thing and just like do mix ins or extends. That's if you really can't, if you're using like WordPress or Drupal and you can't do like component, if you don't want to do like little tiny components in like PHP or something like that. Um, as far as the CSS and JavaScript one goes, I'm sort of leaning towards this thing called freestyle at the moment. And because what it actually does is, I'm not going to use it directly how it is because it sort of still gives you, it'll it'll create a class for every like, you actually write actually like it sort of styles in JavaScript without having to do, you're not composing classes. Um, but it will, if you have like something that says background red, color white, and then you have put that, and you write that in two places, it will sort of deduplicate it and actually create the one, it just does hash classes. Uh, and the way I'm sort of doing it 
going with is then running a utility function for that to then just wrap the, my style in a, in a like little method and it will actually go through that object and create a new class for every single style in the object and then it'll return a string of hashed class names and then those in that class names are reused everywhere so every single style is just a single hash in the CSS so um, then you get very minimal CSS, but it's still like totally reusable. And then you just have like a JavaScript module thing. How do you avoid the situation where you've got multiple team members and there's one of those classes in there that has padding zero and the other one has padding one pixel. Um, functionally, you've written the exact same look and feel, um, but the single difference in the one and your JavaScript hashing is basically yeah, they're two different things. You should totally include them. Yeah, so I guess one way with the, like, you get way more control if you have, like, a utility class because then you can actually detect those sorts of things. You can basically say if there's two, well, you, in that case, you get two keys that are exactly the same. I think Freestyle might even already handle that and it just takes one of them anyway and just gets rid of the other one. Um, or you could actually make it basically like a linter where it goes, you've got two things the same. So it, like that's why I'm going more and more towards after all this experimentation, I'm going more and more towards just using JavaScript because as much as you try and augment CSS, it's still CSS and like just use it for like the like basic stuff that I was really good at and just doing this pure styling stuff and try and leave as much of the like actual programming side of things to um, JavaScript. And yeah, that's sort of like if I've seen a lot of work around also, the other two people to follow are uh, Brent Jackson and John Gold. They're doing like that, like and like Adam Morse that I said before. He's got the like, tachyons.css. Brent Jackson has base CSS, and he also has rebase, which is like in the styles of rebase, uh, React, sorry, with but doing like a similar type of thing with like the themes. Um, John Gold is also doing similar works with tachyons, but also talking about design lint type stuff and basically having one big like JavaScript objects which is like your design system like here's my scales and, and different types of things and like in one place and being able to always use that and even if you have to use SAS you can still import a JSON file into your SAS and use SAS maps so having variables and your design system in like a single place is like really nice um, but yeah sort of we have a lot of tools we have the power to sort of change it and make it simpler What's the, um, what you had on the right there, you had a really good CSS file where you've developed your own sort of system, you started from scratch to get there this time. The next project you do, wouldn't you just use exactly the same one and make your small changes from there? Yeah, exactly. You can pretty much even make it like a, an actual sort of way I've been thinking is like a, you could do an NPM module where you just like include it and then you just create a new instance of it. Thing and then just pass in like some like the custom stuff that you need. If this is your personal bootstrap, if you like, um, are there other great bootstraps out there we should know about of the same sort of design? Um, well, like I was saying, the sort of the at least in like pure CSS side of things, like the tachyons type thing or the ba base CSS, that's sort of the ones the, the sort of ones that people sort of hold up and they've actually got you sort of that the, the, the thing I sort of have the other reason that I've sort of not gone away from that I've gone away from them a bit anatomic CSS is because then you kind of do get down this road of having like you have to know how your CSS classes are named so then it almost feels like another DSL in that you're like yeah this is how you write CSS and then this is how I've done my class names in a specific way and if you're always learning like the new thing and I've, I've gone through I've written my own one and ended up being very similar to tachyons and then very similar to atomic CSS because the atomic CSS uses like the whole Emmet thing because they're trying not to create something totally new um, so that it's all Emmet stuff which wasn't so bad because now that I know it I'm like really quick to write actual CSS but that's why I've come back around to just doing JavaScript and doing an object and using actual CSS that generates a, a class for everyone because then you, you still get that like very minimal CSS um, and as long as you're always like anytime you set a value or anything like that, you're referencing your sort of um, module or whatever for your design constraints. You don't, so if you can sort of set it up so you're not able to pass any values to it, you can kind of like do a linting type thing in that situation. Yeah. 
the yellow. What did you use to do your um, presentation? Uh, spectacle. It's like a React. Spectacle. Yeah. Okay. Where do you get all your gifs from? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Giphy and Googling and mustache. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Feel free to ask me He's going to take us through some of his experiences with 